right, welcome back everybody to CCNA Connecting Networks version 6, chapter 3, Branch Connections. Now chapter 3 is quite a large chapter. Got five major concepts to go through and if it was up to me this probably would have been two chapters because PPPoE, VPNs, GRE and BGP are very big concepts to cover. But at the CCNA level, PPPoE, VPNs, GRE, EGP, BGP, we're just doing entry level. We're just doing basic introduction. Unfortunately, we don't. We have to wait till we get to the CCNP level before we do a much more deeper dive. So we'll start off with remote access connections. Broadband connections. First, we'll start off with the cable connections. You've got your lovely head end with all your pay TV and your email and your internet. Then you've got your cable modem termination services running fiber optics all the way out to telegraph poles in the street. And then they branch off into coaxial cable spanning out in all directions for a couple of hundred meters. And then each household will tap off that coaxial cable. And we're going to form a PPP connection all the way from our cable modem all the way through the infrastructure back to the termination point. So HFC is a new acronym that's, you know, hybrid fiber coaxial cable, but it's been this way for years, but they just decided to give it a new name. DSL, another type of broadband connection we use using the telephone networks. And as you can see there, the maximum recommended distance is five, just over five kilometers. Because it's using copper pairs, attenuation over distance is a huge factor. So the further you are away from the exchange, the worse the attenuation will be and the slower speeds you'll be able to achieve. So ideally, you'd want to be much less than five kilometers away from the exchange over good quality copper pairs to get a really good solid connection. Also notice there that the DSL has line filters for the analog telephony devices. So those, because analog telephones use uh, lower frequencies and the actual broadband communications use the high frequencies. So typically most days we have those filters inside the modem, your phone just plugs straight into the modem. But if you don't have that luxury, then you have to have a little filter between the actual telephone line and your analog, modem, analog phone handset. talked in the, pre in the opening chapter about the different types of Wi-Fi technologies for what we can use over large geographical distances. Like I say, NBN have got their fixed wireless solution, or you can use the 3G, 4G, and now 5G network for your data connections, or you can use satellite if you're in the middle of nowhere. Cable. Bandwidth is shared by many users, but it's usually pretty good. DSL, distance. Distance is a critical factor with DSL. I mean, if the way they're doing NBN now, they've got boxes in almost at the end of your street. So if you're only a couple hundred meters away, then you're gonna get a really good connection. But if you're a kilometer away and the, f the telephone cable in the ground is old and waterlogged, it's gonna be a problem. Fibre to the home, well, that'd be awesome if we had it in Melbourne, but we don't. But other parts of Australia have it, and it's really good. 4G mobile phone networks are good. We don't have a lot of WiMAX, but we've got the NBN fixed wireless, which is okay if you have to use it, but I prefer a fixed line myself, and you've got satellite. Now, PPPoE, a very popular standard for use of broadband. Well, let's look at why. So we learned about PPP in the previous chapter, about that it's protocol independent. So you can have all these different standards and you go PPP from end to end. It supports authentication. So now customers need a username and password to authenticate. 
and PPPoE is called PPPoE because you've got the PPP connection and it's running over Ethernet because if you look at that modem, that 10.1.3.1 modem, the connection to the ISP could be anything but the link between the modem and the router is Ethernet so therefore R1 has to form a PPPoE connection over the Ethernet through the modem all the way into the ISP. When you're configuring PPPoE, you need to create a virtual interface. The PPP interface is a virtual interface called a dialer interface. And then you bind that dialer to the PPP and you bind it to the physical Ethernet, physical interface that it's going to use. And that's how we get the PPP. You should also, because PPP has its own overheads, you need to drop the MTU, the maximum transmission unit, down a little bit from the default of 1500, because those extra eight bytes are gonna be needed just for the PPP headers themselves. And if you leave it at maximum, some of your traffic might get fragmented and some traffic does not like to be fragmented. So you need to push back the MTU from the very start so fragmentation won't occur. Once you've got your PPP connection set up, it's a virtual interface and it shows up just like so show IP interface brief is going to show you that interface. But new command, show interface dialer, just sees the dialer interface. And if the PPP is established, show PPPoE session tells you everything you need to know about that individual PPPoE connection. So let's have a look at how it configures up. So we're on R1 at the moment. So we create an interface, the virtual interface dialer. And we say encapsulation PPP, and we say IP address negotiator, because we're the customer. We set up our chap, PPP chap, hostname Fred, password Barney. We drop the MTU, and we say, okay, you are gonna be part of the dialer pool, dialer pool one. Then we go to the physical interface and we say, you know what physical interface, you're going to be PPPoE and the dialer that is linked to you for the PPPoE is going to be dialer pool number one. Now the reason why this is significant is because you can have one dialer and one pool and multiple interfaces against that pool, like PPP Multilink, for example. So you've got to make sure that the dialer pool number and the dialer pool in the dialer interface match. But the actual interface dialer is not that critical because it can be any number really. But notice that the connection is all the way from R1 all the way through to R2. So the connection between the two digital modems could be anything. It could be DSL, cable, ATM, we don't care. That's why we love PPP because it encapsulates our layer 3 data and whatever other technologies are happening it just goes all the way through. So troubleshooting. Debug PPP negotiation, make sure your passwords are right. Make sure the, the PPPoE tunnel is going to form because both ends have to support PPP. Drop that MTU down. If it's too big then it's going to be fragmentation and things are going to go weird. You can also push back even better with the TCP adjust, the maximum segment size, similar to MTU, but it's a more of a high level pushback. So this way that the, all the software and all the devices behind the router know to drop their payload size even before they begin. And that way everything's going to be encapsulated in that PPPoE and there's going to be no fragmentation. So, now there is a lab on PPPoE, so please do that because it's a very good little lab. VPNs. So, virtual private networks. We need to encrypt our data, we use IPsec, and we connect ourselves across, typically across the public internet. You can have VPNs inside your corporate network, but 99 times out of 100, VPN connections are across the public internet. Now you can use a VPN concentrator, but as far as Cisco is concerned, VPN concentrators are end of life and they've rolled up all the functionality of the VPN concentrator into their ASA. 
So the Cisco ASA is a firewall, but it's also considered to be a VPN concentrator as well. So cost saving, scalability, any broadband will do, and it's really secure. It's as secure as you want to make it. You can have a site to site, dedicated router talking to a dedicated head end. You can have remote access, which is a piece of software on your laptop and you fire it up and you log in to the other end. Now the third one's the most interesting one, dynamic multipoint, because the hub could be the central office and then the spokes could be just small office home office networks. The very top example, side to side, both ends need to have a fixed IP address because the VPN tunnel is built up directly peering based on IP address. But in the bottom example with dynamic multipoint VPN, the three spokes could just have normal DSL or normal broadband where the IP addresses change. So what happens is the hub has got a fixed IP and it's just listening. And then the spokes call out and say, hey, Mr. Hub, I want to form a VPN tunnel with you. So when the hub hears those messages and trusts the authentication method used, then it learns the dynamic IP address of the spoke and then adds it to its mapping commands and then forms the VPN tunnel back now that it's got a fixed IP address that it can use. So that's how it's dynamic. The spokes act a little bit like a client. and They call out and that action of authentication, the hub learns the IP address and then that dynamically configures the IP address to build up that IPsec tunnel. All right, GRE. Generic router encapsulation was first designed as a type of VPN because when they first built it, it was a way to privately isolate traffic from the rest of your network. And it does so. You could have a GRE tunnel between two routers that have 15 routers in between. And as far as the two end routers can see, it'll just be one hop, one GRE tunnel through all that other mess. The only problem with GRE is there's no encryption. So we are logically separating the traffic into its own tunnel, but any wire shark or packet sniffer along the path can look all the way inside all of that traffic and see everything that's going on in there. But the good thing about GRE is that you actually create an interface. So an IPsec tunnel is just like two routers being smashed together, glued together. But a GRE tunnel is an actual tunnel with interfaces and IP addresses and you can monitor it and you can route through it and you can advertise it. So it's also it's useful for that definitely. So the first thing we've got to do is create our virtual interfaces, our tunnel interfaces. Give them IP addresses. Then inside the interfaces we say okay this is where the tunnel is going to start and this is where it's going to terminate. And then there are a few special GRE commands, but typically in Cisco land, we just leave it as the Cisco default and everything works fine. So let's have a look at how that's put together. So we've got the router on the left and the router on the right. We've got the serial interface, the fast ethernet interface and the fast ethernet interface. So we want to make the 172.16, the little private magic network that no one really knows about. So we've got the 210 networks, which are real networks, and then we've got the private networks. So look at the tunnel interface at the bottom. So it's a 172.16.2. The source on the left-hand router is 00, and the destination is 10.10.30.2, which is the serial interface of the right-hand router. So on the right-hand router, everything's reversed. The source, it could be serial, or we could just say 10.10.40.1 because it's a loopback, and the thing we love about loopbacks is they never go down. So it's a routable, achievable, reachable thing. And the destination is 10.10.20.1. So on the right hand side, the tunnel source could have been the interface, but it 
but it could have just as easily been 10.10.30.2 if you wanted, or it just could have been serial zero. But just for fun, we've used 10.10.40.1. Now the reason why this is significant is that the router on the left must be able to see the network 101040. And that's why we're using RIP to advertise that 10 network. So all three routers see all of the 10 networks, 1, 2, 3, 4, 10 networks. And then OSPF, once the GRE tunnel is established, OSPF will kick in and go through that GRE tunnel. And then the OSPF route table will have 172.16.1, 172.16.2 as a proper network, and 172.16.3. So it's a really useful way to make sure the tunnel is separate from the real public traffic by having a completely different routing protocol using it. Show IP interface brief because that tunnel interface is a real interface and it has its ups and downs. So you can really see what it's going on. Once the tunnel is established, use your routing protocol. Show IP route, show IP OSPF neighbor. There, because it's the tunnel, the GRE tunnel interface is a real interface. It just happens to be a virtual connection between the two routers. So all you show neighbors, your show IP routes, your show IP interfaces command all work exactly the same. And 99 times out of 100, if your GRE tunnel doesn't come up, it's either a typo in your source and destination or the two end routers don't have the other sides in their route table. So then you have to troubleshoot RIP in the previous example. All right, BGP. Now, once again, this chapter, chapter three, could have easily been two chapters because things like GRE, VPN, and BGP, BGP is huge. When you get to CCNP, you're going to spend about three chapters on BGP alone. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, so we've got a bit of value add as well. So BGP comes in two flavors, interior and exterior. The exterior BGP is between autonomous systems or companies or ISPs and internal BGP is when you have to route BGP through yourself because you're in the you're the middleman between two ISPs so you have to have BGP running inside yourself as well 99% of all companies that are not ISPs only run BGP on the edge only ISPs need to run BGP internal BGP inside themselves and the only thing we care about in the CCNA at this stage is just external BGP. Why do we even use BGP? What's the point of it? If you're a company and you've only got one connection to the internet and you're one ISP, then you don't need BGP at all. You just have a default route to the internet and they, your ISP, has a default route to your networks via that connection. There's no, need, there's no need to use BGP if you're only single connection to the internet and you're happy just to be a customer of that internet. There are three common ways people can choose to use BGP. Default route only, which is where what we this is what we learn. BGP is big. The internet routing table of BGP is quite big. So if we're a customer, all we need from our ISP is just a way out, default route only. But something else we could learn if we wanted is the default route and everything just our ISP knows. So if we've got Telstra or Optus or TPG or whatever, we'll learn their routes so that we can know how specifically to get around. The third option, of course, is that we get all routes. And if we configure BGP and our ISP will share that with us all the routes, then there's a very high probability that our router will crash because there's something like 500,000 or a million uh, routes, BGP, the current BGP route table. You should Google it after you've finished watching this. How big is the current BGP routing table? And it's really, really humongous. 
So 90% of all people out, all customers out there running BGP only learn from their ISP a default route. So configuring BGP, like I said, tip of the iceberg stuff. There's lots of amazing things we can do with BGP, but for the CCNA level, we just need to get a really basic BGP setup going. So the first thing we need to do is turn it on. We need to set up neighbors because that's the one thing that separates BGP from all other routing protocols. It's the least dynamic routing protocol there is. You have to program everything about it. But because you have to program everything about it, it's also the most powerful because you tell it what you want it to do and it will do it. So we have to enable it. We have to configure our neighbors and then we have to configure what networks we need to advertise. All right, so let's look at the actual commands we need to get BGP to work. So we've got the company on the left, which is autonomous system number 23456. That represents the entire company, the entire autonomous system. And we'll say the one on the right is the ISP, AS7890. We've got three networks. We've got our local network. We've got the link from our us to the ISP, and we've got the, an ISP network. Notice, so on the left-hand router, we go router BGP and then our own autonomous system number. So router BGP 23456. We've got to advertise our networks because if you don't advertise your networks, you have to have nothing's going to be learnt. So you've got to advertise them. And then we have a neighbor statement. Now the neighbor is the IP address of the remote side and it's the autonomous system number of the re remote side. So router BGP, our own autonomous system number, and then the neighbor statement says neighbor 200.1.1.2, the remote AS of 7890. And if we look over to the right hand side, to the ISP's router, you'll see that it's the exact reverse. Router BGP, their own AS number, then the neighbor statement with the IP address of, the, of us and our AS number. So they're a matched pair reversing each other. Another thing to note too with those network statements, you could put in four or five or six network statements of any IP addresses that you would like to advertise but BGP will not actually advertise those networks until those networks are alive. So if you do show up your route and a network is not in the routing table, BGP will refuse to advertise it, even if you have the, the network statement. So it doesn't matter how many network statements or what network statements you have, if that network doesn't exist, BGP will not advertise it. So, and particularly do with summarization. Notice that if we just did 200.1.1.0 without the mask, it probably, it might not advertise it because it's a slash 30, not a slash 24. So just remember, if you've got weird subnetting, add the mask on the end and BGP will not advertise a network unless the network statement is there and that network is alive. It exists in the route table. So just a bit of value add, a little bit of value add for BGP because like I say, in the material, BGP is very light on, very thin, just what we saw in the previous slide. So I just thought I'd give you a bit of, bit of bonus BGP information because BGP is awesome, it's very powerful and it can do many, many, many things. So I'm just going to give you two examples, two basic simple examples of the power that BGP has. So this is us at the bottom we're the customer and then we've got ISP number one and ISP number two and they're both links off to the public internet. Do we want to be in the path of the internet? Do Are we an ISP? Are we a small ISP so therefore we want internet traffic to flow through us? If the answer is yes then we want to be transit. But if we're a customer we don't want all of our lovely, lovely bandwidth used up by just randos. Then we want to be non-transit. We want to be a customer with two links to the internet and we do not want the internet to use us as a path to get from ISP1 to ISP2. 
We can influence the way the ISPs learn about us. We can actually tell ISP1, hey, uh, this is the way to go. I am awesome this way. And we can tell ISP2, this is a bad way. Don't come via me. And that way we give them priority for all our traffic to ISP1. And this is called MED, multi-exit discriminator. This is why, sorry, this is how we can influence the traffic path from the public internet to us. We're telling ISP1 the best way to get to us is this way. And we're telling ISP2 this is a bad way to come to us. So therefore ISP1 will most of the public internet it will find us through ISP1. The next thing we can do is we can learn differently. So no matter what ISP1 has to tell us we will prefer that to be better than anything that ISP2 tells us. So they're both going to tell us the same information, but as we learn information from ISP1, we say that's awesome. And as we learn information from ISP2, we say it's not as awesome. And this is called local preference. We are locally preferring to use ISP1. So this way, ISP1 will be 90% of all of our traffic and ISP2 will be a little bit of traffic left over that customers who are directly connected to ISP2 will use because the path from ISP2 to us is better than going through the mess in the middle over to ISP1 and then to us. So MED, multi-exit discriminator, is what we tell the ISPs. Local preference is the way we influence the way we learn from our ISPs. And this is the way we set up, whether we're transit or non-transit, which link is better than the other link, primary and a backup. So how do we verify our BGP operation? Show IP protocol, show IP route, show IP BGP. Show IP BGP summary is really useful because it's just a couple of lines. Show IP BGP neighbor, useful to make sure your neighbor is up. Now the next two aren't in the material, but I put them there because they're super, super useful. Show IP BGP and the IP address, sorry, show IP BGP neighbor and the IP address of that neighbor and the word routes. That is the list of information we're learning from that neighbor. The information we're gonna learn from that neighbor. Show IP BGP neighbor, the IP address of the neighbor and advertise routes is the list of networks we're telling our neighbor. So if you've got networks that aren't appearing and you're not quite sure why, those two commands are gonna tell you. They're gonna tell you what you're learning from your neighbor and what you're trying to tell your neighbor. Very useful troubleshooting tools to see why the route tables don't have the routes that you think they're gonna have. Very useful commands. All right, like I said, I wish this chapter was longer and we spent a lot more time on VPNs and BGP, but at this stage of the CCNA career, we just need to dip our toe in the pool and learn the, con the basic, basic concepts of what they are, and then we can hunger for more knowledge when we get to CCNP. So lots of different broadband stuff. We talked about broadband in the previous chapter, If you've got lots of broadband, then you figure out which is the best. PPPoE is what we all is what we all use. We don't know that we've been using it, but we've been using it for years. If we've got a cable modem or a DSL modem, we've been using PPPoE. Unless you've got a DSL modem where the modem does the termination and then you're using PPPoA, because technically speaking, DSL uses ATM. So that's PPP over ATM. But if you've got a cable modem, or if you've got a router plugging into a modem to an ISP and the router is where the PPP terminates, then it's always PPPoE. And there is a PPPoE lab for this chapter and I strongly recommend you doing it. VPNs are awesome. GRE is an amazing tunneling protocol, but it's not secure. There's no encryption at all. So IPsec is the one you want to use. 
Now, some people use the combination of the two, and there's nothing wrong with that. Set up a GRE tunnel to make a perfect little network, and then just put IPsec over the top of it, and then everything's encrypted. BGP, fantastic protocol, super duper duper powerful. Know when to use it, know what to learn from it. And be careful not to learn the entire route table of the public internet, because it's big. All right, and that's the end of that. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll see you on the next one.